Hey everybody, um, we had some very good news with regard to the making a murderer case, Andy Colvin's attempt to extort money from Netflix, at least that would be my uh, perception of what was going on here, um, failed miserably. And uh, I've got, uh, probably we'll, we'll do this in, a, in a two or three parts. Um, I'd like to take you back though to this article um, in the... Uh, <laughs> Wisconsin press. So this was going back to 2020, 2021. Let's have a look. Make the murder. Yes, this is this is W Bay, uh, second of June, 2021. So this was the uh, going back to the early part of this case. A federal court in Wisconsin has denied a request by Netflix and filmmakers to di dismiss a defamation lawsuit filed by a former Manitrop County Sheriff's Office sergeant featured in the Making a Murder documentary series. Andrew Colburn filed a lawsuit in the United States District Court of the Eastern District of Wisconsin, stating the series about the trials and convictions of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey is, quote, biased and falsely depicts him as having framed Avery for the Theresa Holbach murder. Colbuck says, Colbuck says he has received an onslaught of threats and criticism. In a decision released May the 26th, United States District Judge Brett H. Ludwig ruled that Colburn had adequately pleaded claims for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress under Wisconsin law. Ludwig denied the Netflix and the filmmakers motion to dismiss. That means the lawsuit, lawsuit will move forward in federal court. Coburn's complaint states that the defendants committed defamation with actual malice in order to make their series more profitable and more successful in the eyes of their peers. The judge says Netflix has failed to convince the court of the inadequacy of Colburn's allegations, and they have failed in rejecting the claims as a matter of law. The judge, however, granted Netflix motion when it comes to Colburn's claims of negligence. The filmmakers wanted the case thrown out due to claims that Colburn failed to serve them in a timely manner with his complaints. The judge disagreed. They also claimed that the statute of limitations had run out for Colburn to make his claim. The judge said records show process, process servers made several attempts to deliver the complaint to them, meaning he exercised reasonable diligence. The judge says statement, statements made in true crime documentaries do not give the filmmakers protection under the First Amendment. Whether Colburn can muster sufficient evidence for a jury to find that Netflix and other defendants defamed him with actual malice remains to be seen. But until the summary judgment record is complete, it would be improper for the court to resolve this issue, states Ludwig. Netflix and the filmmakers will now have to issue their response to Colburn's second amended complaint. The judge noted that the case has been long stalled at the pleading stage due to delays and amended complaints filed by Colburn. The judge also admonished the defendant, saying they've flooded the court with lengthy briefs, raising disputed factual and legal issue against a still undeveloped record. Meanwhile, Stephen Avery continues to appeal his conviction in the 2005 murder of Teresa Holbach in Manitrop County, a judge is set to make a decision on whether the case should be sent down to court so Avery can introduce new witness statements and evidence. <clears throat> Avery attorney Kathleen Zellner filed a motion with the Wisconsin Court of Appeals asking to stay the appeal so Avery can file a motion disclosing new evidence of what's known as a Brady violation and to introduce a third party subject. As I say, that's going back to June 21, so nearly a year and a half ago. Um, sorry, nearly, yeah, nearly a year and a half ago. Um, interesting that, isn't it? I, I think that um, Coleman and uh, Wiesbach were felt, probably felt a bit slightly empowered 
to pursue this case, given the fact that um, Judge Sukovic has been so um, obstructive in this case, and they've they've just developed this feeling of you know they can do whatever they like because the Wisconsin courts are in their favour. Um, but as I say, I, I think for me, I think it was always a case of uh, El, um, Colburn and Griesbach simply wanting to try and threaten Netflix so that they would settle out of court with a with a nice a nice little paycheck to Andy, um, and also to damage therefore the uh, the sort of case against Steve. Now then, let's uh, stop that. Oh, sorry, I've gone a bit a uh, bit wonky here. Let's have a look. See what I can do about that. Let's not back up. There we go. Okay, but you don't need to see me for this next article. So let's uh, find the next article. See if I've frozen again. No, not yet. Okay, so let's share this one. Okay, so I wanted to find out a little bit more about Brett Ludwig because anybody reading that would think that Brett is somewhat in the favour of uh, the claimant, um, Andy Colburn. Although with judges, you never know, do you? Watching from afar, I can't say that I have, having watched the likes of <laughs> Willis and Fox um, and Tsukovic. Uh, I don't have much trust in them, although some of the other judges, um, Duffin and this fellow Ludwig, makes you realise that when the system works the way it's meant to work, it actually works very well. Um, so... Brett Ludwig, the, the judge in this case, is a partner with Foley and Lardner, where he concentrates on representing clients in complex business disputes as a member of the firm's business litigation and dispute resolution practice. Among other matters, Mr. Ludwig represents insurers and reinsurers in both litigation and arbitration proceedings and is a member and former vice chair of the firm's insurance and reinsurance litigation practice and a part of the insurance and reinsurance industry team. This complex litigation work also includes representations of clients in class action litigation as a part of the firm's antitrust practice. Before joining Foley, Mr. Ludwig was a law clerk to the Honorable George G. Fagg, Circuit Judge, United States Courts of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. Mr. Ludwig has taken cases through trial for clients in a variety of industries, including insurance, healthcare, manufacturing, and medical technology. Mr. Ludwig's practice includes a focus on reinsurance counseling and dispute resolution, and he has litigated and arbitrated cases to final decision for both seeding companies and reinsurers. He also has a substantial practice in general insurance matters. Mr. Ludwig is active in local civil and community initiatives. In February of 2012, the firm's management appointed him chair of the Milwaukee Office Pro Bono Committee. He is also a director of the Mekon Tainsville Education Foundation. Okey so let's fast forward. There's a couple of things I wanted to share with you. As I say, that was um, them, um, the Wisconsin News, telling us about how Andy Coleman is progressing in his uh, case against uh, Netflix. Let's fast forward from June 21 to, what do we know, March 2023. For that. Um, <laughs> Luna is still a rather exuberant puppy, um, and I hope she um, enjoys being an exuberant puppy for a long time to come. And uh, let's carry on then with Okie dokie. So as I say, the 
you know, when you, when you look at this case and you you realise that yeah, okay, it took a, took a wee while, and uh, for me, um, Colburn and Griesbach felt empowered by the stalling process of Sukovic to then come up with this claim against Netflix, which I think was purely for money. The idea being that in other cases of uh, films by Netflix, they have had to settle with people um, for sometimes large amounts of money. And so for me, it was just a, a get rich quick exercise. Um, they tried to throw as much uh, mud at the wall to see if any of it would stick. And of course, in the early stages, um, Judge uh, Brett Ludwig um, did the correct thing, I suppose, in not dismissing the case, but examining the case and finding out for himself. Until, of course, <laughs> March 10th, 2023, his conclusion, uh, you know, uh, what do we, as I say, um, more than a year and a half later, well, more than a year and a half later, uh, year and three quarters later, for the foregoing reasons, it is hereby ordered that defendant Netflix in, incorporated, incorporated motion for summary judgment is granted. It is further ordered that defendants Laura and Moira and Crow Media motion for summary judgment is granted. And the best bit, it is further ordered that plaintiff Andrew Colburn's motion for partial summary judgment is denied. Uh, I must say there was there were some some of the quotes in this by uh, by Mr Ludwig were absolutely um, brilliant. I loved. Well, let's let's go let's go up to the start. Let's see if I can find this. I think it was page eight. I love this bit. I'll, I love that. Just we'll go through the whole lot, but <laughs> this bit here. All right. Yeah, uh, Colbert felt stung by making a murderer's inclusion of Glynn's statement. There is not only something to this idea that law enforcement had information about somebody else, but there is serious meat on those bones. I mean, serious meat. What we learn is that while Stephen Avery is sitting in prison now for a decade, a telephone call comes in to the Manitrock County Sheriff's Department from another law enforcement agency, saying that they had someone in custody who said he, that he had committed an assault in Manitrock and an assault for which somebody was currently in prison. <laughs> now, this statement may be unflattering, but the record confirms it is entirely accurate. The same can be said for the docu-series use of Coleman's deposition testimony from Avery's civil case. <laughs> this is the best bit, best bit for me. Altogether, Colburn complained seven times of statements that no one, not even himself, can prove false. And in these instances, it is the facts that aggrieve Colburn. And Andy, Andy, just, just, just for your benefit, okay, Judge Ludwig has made it totally clear there is no legal remedy from that. You cannot ask a judge to remedy the fact that you are aggrieved by what Glynn has said and what the documentary has said. Anyway, let's get back to the to the very beginning of this. Let's do this real quick once. <laughs> so Andrew Colburn, plaintiff versus Netflix, the defendants. Order on motions for summary judgment. And I must, I must give this judge credit. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? How um, you get a judge who, in 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 the start, he has to believe both sides, so he wants to find out more about this case, and he does so. On December 18, 2015, Netflix released the ten-part docu-series "Making a Murderer," and turned small town sergeant Andrew Colburn into a household name. He now very much wishes it had not. His unflattering portrayal in the series 
transformed his 15 minutes of fame into what felt like a far longer period of infin infamy as a mob of mob sorry of outraged viewers flooded his voicemail and email inboxes with vile and hostile messages well i can honestly say i never i never messaged andy colburn i uh, i went to the um, the organ grinder rather than the monkey and sent messages to uh, robert herman but not hostile. There's no point in sending hostile messages. Uh, you're just proving yourself as bad as them. Um, some called him a crooked cop. <laughs> Others wished him a long and pleasant stay in fiery perdition. <laughs> as I say, the guy has done his homework on this. At least one person threatened to harm his family, which is not good. Meanwhile, 2,000 miles away, Making a murderous producers were basking in accolades and consorting with major media outlets. Critics lauded their journalistic tenacity and unique ability to synthesize the legal and dramatic. Coleman received no such flattery as the producers took the stage at the Microsoft Theater to accept their Emmys. He was busy boarding up the front door of his own house. Outraged by what he believed to be the grossly unjust inverted life trajectories, Colburn filed this lawsuit, accusing Netflix, Incorporated, Chrome Media and producers Laura and Moyer of defamation. All defendants have moved for summary judgment. Colburn has also moved for partial summary judgment on 52 allegedly defamatory statements. The dispositive question is whether Colburn has produced sufficient evidence to make a defamation case out of his admittedly harsh betrayal. He has not. The First Amendment does not guarantee a public figure like Colburn the role of protagonist in popular discord. In fact, it protects the media's ability to cast him in as much less in a much less flattering light. So defendants are entitled to summary judgments on all counts. Factual background. Again, you have to uh, admire the, the judge um, doing <laughs> you know, what a good judge should do, and that is to look at the, the, the evidence, look at the facts. Making a murder attempts to condense the tumultuous, tumultuous life of convicted murderer Stephen Avery into roughly 10 hours of narratively satisfying television. The series opens in 1985 when police arrested Avery, then only 23 years old, but already well acquainted with the criminal justice. Sorry, did I say justice? Sorry, with the criminal system and charged him with the attempted murder, sexual assault, and false imprisonment of Penny Bernstein. Um, Although he professed his innocence, a jury accepted Bernstein's eyewitness testimony and convicted Avery on all counts, and a judge sentenced him to 60 years in prison. Hmm, I thought it was 32, but it could be that with the other charge, I, I, I really don't know where the 60 years comes from. Um, and I'm not completely happy about the spelling of Bernstein there, but anyway. About 10 years later, in 1894-95, Andrew Colburn, let's just call him Andy, a Manitrop County Jail Corrections officers, Officer filled a phone call from a detective in another jurisdiction. The detective relayed that an inmate in the nearby Bryan County Jail, that's up in Green Bay, had claimed responsibility for a sexual assault that Manitrop County had ascribed to someone else. Coleman transferred the call to a detective division and, consistent with his unlimited position, took no further action. Other members of law enforcement would later testify that then Manitrop County Sheriff Tom, Tom Kusurik assured, Col assured Coleman that authorities had the right guy. I certainly know that he assured uh, Penny of that. Um, 
If the call Colburn received was indeed about Stephen Avery, which seems likely but is not established, the sheriff's assurances were utterly misplaced. Manitrock County did not, in fact, have the right guy. In 2002, using DNA evidence, attorneys for the Wisconsin Innocence Project proved that Gregory Allen, and not Stephen Avery, was the one behind Bernstein's violent assault. Thus, on September 11, 2003, 18 years after he was wrongfully convicted, Avery walked free. One day later, at his superior's request, Colburn, now a sergeant in the Manitrop County Sheriff's Office, authored a statement regarding the phone call he had received eight or nine years prior. Manitrop County delivered that statement to the Wisconsin Department of Justice, which reviewed it as part of its investig investigation into Sheriff Kishurik's and District Attorney Dennis Vogel's handling of the Bernstein case. Wisconsin Attorney General Peg Leitzelaga ultimately chose not to charge Kasurik or, oops, that was not a good move. To charge Kasurik or Vogel But that did not stop Steve from filing his own lawsuit against those who he deemed responsible for his wrongful incarceration. In 2004, he sued both the sheriff and DA, as well as Man Manitrop County, for 36 million, alleging they had unconstitutionally withheld exculpatory evidence while he remained in prison. While Avery's civil suit was pending, Teresa Holbach, a 25-year-old professional photographer, from Calumet County, Wisconsin, disappeared on business in Manitrop. On November the 3rd, 2005, Holbach's family filed a missing person report, which investigators relayed to on-duty officers, including Sergeant Colburn. As part of his investigation, Andy visited Steve's salvage yard and spoke with Steve himself. He also called dispatch to confirm that the license plate corresponded to a 99 Toyota registered to Teresa. That 99 RAV4 proved critical to the investigation. On November the 5th, authorities discovered it on the curtilage of Avery's property. With Steve now a prime suspect, police obtained a warrant to search his trailer and garage, garage which Colburn Manitrop County Deputy James Lenk and Calumet County Deputy Dan Kucharski and possibly a couple of aliens, but uh, Dan never saw them, executed between November the 5th and the 8th. On the final day of the search, in a fit of frustration, Colburn violently shook a bookcase located in Avery's bedroom. Moments later, Lenk discovered the key to Holbach's Toyota lying on the floor. The evidence against Steve then quickly began to mount. Not only did police find his DNA on the key, they also found both his and Teresa's blood inside her vehicle and retri retrieved her remains from a burn pit on his property. Now confident in his case, Special Prosecutor <laughs> Ken Rapist Kratz officially charged Avery with homicide on November 15, 2005. Weeks later, Graduate film students Laura and Moira travelled to Manitrock and commenced work on a project that would eventually become Making a Murderer. Steve went to trial on February 12, 2007 in Manitrock County Circuit Court. His defence attorneys, <laughs> Dean and Jerry, argued, among other things, that the vindictive Manitrock County Sheriff's Office, office still fuming over Steve's prior exoneration, had planted evidence to ensure conviction of a man they had already deemed guilty. As part of his defence, Dean cross-examined Andy, challenging his motives, challenged his motives, and tried to paint his conduct as unscrupulous. Andy repeatedly denied any, denied any wrongdoing. In closing argument, Kratz explicitly called the frame-up defence a red herring because... Regardless of whether police planted the Toyota key or Avery's blood, the abundance of other evidence <laughs> sufficed to establish Steve's guilt beyond a reasonable date. The jury apparently, 
I like that. Apparently agreed. It returned a guilty verdict on the charges of intentional homicide and felon in possession of a firearm. And Avery was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Laura and Moira spent the next several years editing footage and mapping out the first few episodes of their project. By July 2013, the pair had independently shot 90% of the series and produced rough cuts of the first three episodes. One year later, impressed with their work, Netflix licensed Making a Murder, the company appointed uh, Lisa Nisha. Nishimura, Adam Del Dio, Ben Kotner, and Marjan Jadavi to oversee the project. This core team provided feedback and suggestions to help shape the look and feel of the series. The Moira and Laura retained responsibility for editing the cuts. And according to the Netflix team, none of them reviewed the raw footage of the trial or depositions. The finished product premiered on December the 18th, 2015, to critical and commercial acclaim. In this final cut, Coleman's three-hour trial testimony is reduced to 10 minutes spread across several episodes. Dramatic musical flourish flourishes accent particular moments. And anachronistic responses are stitched together to give the appearance of a seamless examination. The episodes also platform Dean and Strand, who, in out-of-court interviews, reiterate their theory that Manitrop law enforcement officials planted evidence. Netflix later released a second season of the programme, also produced by Moira and Laura, which focused on Steve's post-conviction attorney's attempts to exonerate him. Then we get the slightly complicated stuff. But anyway, summary judgment is appropriate where the admissible evidence reveals no genuine issue of any material fact. Material facts are those under the applicable substantive law that might affect the outcome of the suit. An issue of material fact is genuine if the evidence is such that a reasonable jury could return a verdict for the non-moving party. If the parties assert different views of the facts, the court must view the record in the light most favourable to the non-moving party. Analysis. Andy has two claims for relief, for, le for relief. His primary legal theory is defamation, but he also alleges intentional infliction of emotional distress. Based on the record, neither claim survives summary judgment. Number one. And his defamation claims fail as a matter of law. Colburn has only seen about an hour of making a murderer. <laughs> but that was enough for him to dub it defamatory. Wisconsin law and the First Amendment require a deeper and more comprehensive analysis. To prove defamation under Wisconsin law, a plaintiff must show that the defendant, one, published true at two, a false, three, defamatory, and four, unprivileged statement. For public officials like Colburn, the First Amendment also requires clear and convincing evidence that the defendant published the defamatory statement with actual malice, i.e. with knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. And the statement at issue must be of and concerning the plaintiff. These legal standards wipe out the bulk of Colburn's case. His summary judgment motion adopts an overbroad view of defamation, identifying 52 allegedly defamatory statements. But most of his gripes read more like media criticism better suited to the OPED section. They are not actionable statements that could even potentially be defamatory under Wisconsin law. Those few statements that might conceivably be actionable fail for other reasons. Colburn's defamation by fabricated quotation claim fares no better because the record shows no instance in which defendants did not convey the gist of a changed quotation. Colburn's final theory, a claim for defamation by implication, also fails because he has not produced sufficient evidence to sustain it. 
Accordingly, the defamation claim cannot proceed to trial. A, most of Colvin's 52 defama defamatory statements are not actionable, and those that are fail for other reasons. Colburn affirmatively seeks summary judgment in his own favour based on a host of specific aspects of making a murder. <laughs> his kitchen sink, <laughs> kitchen sink approach and identifies 52 instances of alleged defamation. He cites the series Use of Music and Graphics. <laughs> you know, I like to use music in a certain way. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> if we weren't allowed to use music in certain ways, I dread to think what sort of sentence I would get. Anyway, carrying on. It's, it's inclusion of certain statements of and concerning other people, it's incorporation of true statements or protected opinions, and the alter, alteration of reaction shots from Steve's homicide trial, none of these can support a claim for def defamation. <laughs> Music and graphics, for example, in isolation, are not statements of fact capable of filching from one his good name. Um, that ousts 13 of Andy's proposed 52 statements. While it is true that Netflix's representatives sought to establish a subtle but impactful theme track for the baddies, no principle of defamation law subjects a publisher to liability based solely on an unnerving musical motive. So at least I'm safe. Moreover, Colburn is not even one of the that is listed in the Netflix notes. So the notes and the corresponding music are also not actionable because they are not of and concerning him. Colburn makes similar futile challenges to other statements that are not of and concerning him. For example, he objects to Stephen Avery's voiceover. They had the evidence back in 85 that I didn't do it, but nobody said anything. Though Colburn identifies the voiceover as defamatory, he never explains how it implicates him or why is it why it is false. This is not an anomalous oversight. Colburn also takes issue with Steve Glynn, attorney, in his 36 million civil case saying, we were just on the absolute edge of getting ready to go after the named defendants in the case with depositions when I get a call from Walt Kelly, who tells me that he has gotten a call from a journalist asking if either of us would care to comment on the apparent intersection of life between Stephen Avery and Teresa. On its face, this has nothing to do with Colburn, and he offers no evidence or analysis to the contrary. It therefore cannot be defamatory towards him. The same applies to the words a male bar patron, I only have one word from, from the cop. Cops on up, it's corruption. Big time. I mean, if people dig far enough, they'll see that. If this vague critique of bureaucracy constituted defamation, free speech would be reduced to the freedom to commend those in power. I like that. It's very true. Um... Yet Colburn relies on 22 allegedly statements of this ilk. They weren't just going to let Steve out. They weren't just going to hand that man 36 million. All I can think is they were trying to railroad me again. Them people ain't going to get away with everything. Other parts of Andy's case reflect his own dissatisfaction with what is in fact the verifiable truth it is well established that truth is an absolute defense to a defamation claim. Thus, in defamation lawsuits, at least, verity still prevails, e prevails even if the audience lacks the temperament for it. Colburn felt stung by Glynn's statement. This is 
is where we kind of started. There is not only something to this idea that law enforcement had information about somebody else, but there is serious meat on those bones. I mean serious meat. What we learn is that while Stephen Avery is sitting in prison, now for a decade, a telephone calls, call comes into the Manitrop County Sheriff's Department from another enforcement agency saying that they had someone in custody who said they had committed an assault in Manitrop and an assault for which somebody was currently in prison. This statement may be unflattering. I don't even know that it's unflattering. It's simply the truth. That's what happened. But the record confirms it is entirely accurate. The same can be said for the uh, Netflix's use of Colvin's deposition testimony from Avis' civil case. As I say, altogether, Colvin complained seven times of statements that not one that no one, not even himself, can prove false. In these instances, it is the facts that aggrieve Colburn and sorry, Andy, there is no remedy for that. Nor can Colburn make a defamation case out of his advers adver ad 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 adversaries, adversaries opinions. Although opinions are not completely exempt from the realm of defamatory communications, if it is plain that the speaker is expressing a subjective view, an interpretation, a theory, conjecture or surmise, rather than claiming to be in possession of objectively verifiable facts, the statement is not actionable. For example, contrary to Corbyn's claims, no reasonable viewer could interpret Glynn's explanation of why he thinks Colburn authored a report the day after Avery left prison. I think I know why Colburn authored that report at the time as anything other than a subjective view, an interpretation of theory. Defamation, defamation cannot lie for such plainly speculative statements. Colburn relies on another 10 similarly subjective opinions as part of his defense case, but these speculations are not actionable as a matter of law. Equally meritless are Colburn's attempts to turn spliced reaction shots into slander. It is undisputed that the producers experienced technolo technological snafus. Now, I have to thank the dude uh, for telling me what snafus were many years ago. I had no idea. Uh, situation normal, um, all um, effed up. <laughs> that rendered the unedited raw footage of the witness box at Steve's trial unusable. As a result, Laura and Moira paid local news outlets for access to their mixed feed footage, which cut between counsel, the judge, witnesses, the gallery, and the projection screen. Because the mixed feed did not attempt to adopt a steady point of view, it did not always maintain its gaze on witnesses when they stopped speaking. To accommodate for this limitation, the producers occasionally used witness reaction shots from other parts of the trial to fill in the gaps. Uh -huh. Andy contends that rather than chose the most comparable reaction shots, Moira and Laura used the corrupted footage as an excuse to insert incongruous scenes that made him appear nervous and uncertain. The problem with this theory is that reaction shots are not falsifiable statements capable of defaming their subjects. In fact, Andy's papers implicitly acknowledge the vagaries of body language analysis. He has, at different times, described the same shot, leaning back and cracking his knuckles, as making him look apprehensive and more confident. If the scenes the producers included are open to such ambiguity, then they are not false in any meaningful sense. And the ob abstruse, abstruse knuckle cracking is interstitial. No, you've lost me there. Brett. Uh, is Colburn's strongest case. His other examples describe extensive psychoanalytical intentions to momentary breaks in eye contact. None of this is defamatory. 
Colvin is therefore not entitled to summary judgment on any of the 52 allegedly statements he identifies conversely because no reasonable juror could find any of the 52 statements defamatory. Defendants are entitled to summary judgment on any claim based on them. Let's, uh, let's leave it there and we'll carry on from the next bit. Um, I think I've read through the whole lot. Uh, as I say, very, very impressed with uh, with what's been done. Um, I suspect my camera, oh no, still working. Uh, you'll be disappointed to see. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how um, when a proper judge looks at a case, um, from seemingly being in one position that is hopefully neutral to then examining what what went on. And he's clearly uh, done his homework on this. I would have to give the judge credit. Um, but this is what we tend to find with most of the federal judges. Uh, Mr. Hamilton, uh, no, you are not on my uh, list of best federal judges. Um, but anyway... Um, Let's, as I say, let's leave it there and we'll look at the next bit in, in a wee while. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in. Catch you all again soon, hopefully. Bye for now.